search of truth. And he found truth on a high hill behind the rocks, behind the rivers and the forests. There she was. She was wrinkled and ugly. She only had one tooth. And he lived with her for nine years. When he departed, he said, do you mind if I inform on you? Do you mind if I spread your story? Do you mind if I spread your teachings? She said, not at all. I want people to know about the truth. But one thing before you go. When you speak of me, remember, she was wrinkled, she was old, she was ugly, and she only had one too. She said, when you speak of me, say that I am young and beautiful. You see, it's at times like those that we need a pantomime audience. Oh yes we do. She was ugly. Oh yes she was. This is the essence of science. You see it's even better than a third umpire. There's always some kind of dispute. Now I don't have actually a pantomime audience that goes around with me. But I have something that Rupert Sheldrake would be very happy with. I have a cat, and my cat is a skeptic. So whenever somebody makes some kind of assertion, my cat says, oh no it isn't, oh no it isn't. The other night I was watching somebody sing. He was a Broadway singer, and he said, you only have one life! And my cat said, oh no we don't, we have many lives. And so it has proved for me. When my cat was watching the cricket, she knew better than that third umpire. My cat is a contrarian. My cat questions authority. And that's what I came to learn when I found myself among scientists. It was really morphic resonance, if you like. It was really coincidence. It was just strange. I happened to find that scientists were saying the observer affects that which is being observed. Somehow in the theatre, which is where I usually work as a storyteller, I was finding something really remarkable was going on. Oh yes, I was. I was finding that somehow the universe was no longer, according to the physicists, a universe for observation. Somehow we need to break through the glass that separated us from the atoms that we were examining. Because after all, there was some kind of subatomic particle, some kind of atom in the glass itself. So we had to shatter the glass, coming as I did from South Africa, where third umpires aren't altogether trustworthy, and where the truth isn't always the truth or wasn't when I was young. Coming from South Africa under apartheid, I learned that separation was in fact an illusion. No longer should we think of the universe as one for observation. We should think of it as a universe for participate. All those who don't like audience participation say yes. yes. <laughs> now, Rupert said that he wasn't going to tell stories. He said he was going to talk about theory. Theory, the word theory and the word theater actually come from the same Greek root. I don't have time to tell you what happened to me initially when I went to join a think tank. I can't tell you the whole story. I can tell you how I got invited. A man phoned me up and said he'd read my book, it's on the shelves there, um, Bluff Your Way in the Quantum Universe. He just said, Jack, I'm trying to bring together all the geniuses of the whole world. I said, hold on. He said, no, no, not you. I'm not going to bring you as a genius. You will be the one who knows nothing. But I want you to come and be the professor of the public understanding of science in a think tank. I said, I don't know anything about science. I've never had a science lesson in my life. And uh, most of my teachers at uh, school, well, if you were to describe them, you'd have to find a lot of synonyms for awful. He said, never mind. He said, everyone is faking it. And so it was that about 10 years ago, I joined a think tank 
at the heart of Europe. It, there's a lot of sniggering in the cheap seats when I say it was in Brussels, but um, this was, you know, the centre of Europe. And also it's very important because the most uncomfortable place in the world to be in is in the wrong with the possible exception of Belgium. And this was a lesson for me to understand that science isn't necessarily about finding an infinity of things that are right. It's also about finding those infinity, that infinity of things about which we can be wrong. Now, I'm just going to tell you, as a sort of only I escape to tell you this, some of the things that I have gleaned, not only by working among scientists, but since then. They talked about the cutting edge in the billing. And so let me divide up those areas in which we can expect many changes to occur into A, B, C, and D. Atoms and all things to do with physics, bytes and all things to do with computers, cells and all things to do with biology, and days, this is my own invention, uh, to do with a culture, a tiny entity in a culture, a day. Let's start with atoms. Now, of course, we know that these things have the potential to destroy us, utterly. So when I, we talk about science and the cutting edge, I'm not just talking about foretelling the future, but of course, enabling it. When we say that um, we're concerned about the future and we talk about artists among scientists, people are very fond of quoting C.P. Snow, who made a speech 50 years ago about art and science. I'd rather quote Albert Camus, who died 50 years ago almost to the day. And he said, real generosity towards the future lies in dedicating everything to what happens now. Obviously, atoms can destroy us. They can also do a certain amount of good, and people have told me, well, remember, you can always say, oh no, they won't, but they will, so they say, be able to use atoms in operations. They will be able to use the magnetic fields to manipulate particles inside our bodies. They also say that they will be able to replicate objects. In other words, they'll be able to take the uh, atoms and constitute things. That means that you will no longer have to shop. Oh yes, we will. Oh no, we won't. This may be very good news for men, not so good news for women. But the idea that you can actually, for $29.99, get a machine, and that machine will make everything that you could ever need. You will never have to worry about poverty again. So they say, oh yes, we will. Oh no, we won't. But. I worked with a scientist and created a character of a computer who said, you think you're so clever. I say, who? Maybe the computer was a who. You're just wet where? I am so many times more powerful than the pathetic little god you dreamed. Is this possible? Oh, yes, it is. Oh, no, it isn't. I went up to a computer expert and I said, do you think that computers are going to take over? He said, I can't see why they would bother. <laughs> Nevertheless, and this is a big scientific word, computers are growing exponentially. There are many things that they can do already that far transcend what we can do in terms of calculations and so on. And we all know about robotics. Cells. Here again, there are so many controversies, and that's where my cat is going to be very handy, because when they say genetic, be modified foods are going to be good for us, my cat may well say, oh no, they won't. And yet, every scientist I have spoken to who talks about the need for feeding the world will argue with my cat and with me and say, please listen to us. We do need to use the genetically modified foods. This is where the cat and where the skeptic is handy, because you can question what those scientists say every bit as much as you can question the ones who say, we're not really interested in cloning, we are interested in helping people. We're using stem cell research to try and make people better. Oh no, you aren't. Oh yes, they are. You see, this oh no, we won't thing is so terribly important for an artist like me because the audience, after all, makes up their own mind. I trained as a lawyer, and I found it was wonderful when I didn't have to try and persuade people in a South African court 
as to the justice or injustice of something, but the audience actually makes up their own mind. So in a sense, you're the cat, you're the pantomime audience. So when, just by the way, people talk about weapons of mass destruction, oh no, there aren't. Or when they talk about climate change, one can actually question those scientists who cheated in East Anglia, but at the same time find a way of saying it isn't actually that good when we spew black fumes out into the atmosphere. And finally, days. When you take all those disciplines, A, B, C, and you combine them together and cross-fertilize them, you develop something like uh, intellectual nectarines. You make many, many advances in a range of ways. You also do stuff that is really pretty scary or pretty inspiring, depending on how you are as a pantomime audience. I have encountered people Ray Kurzweil is one, Michu Kapu is another, who say that we don't have to die. Oh yes, we do. Oh no, we don't. Science is now saying that there are people here in their 50s and younger who could live to 150 years or more. There are people who don't have to die. Maybe you'll be able to choose when you die. Or to live forever, if not constituted in your body, through the, the, the means of uh, the cell uh, science and so on, but through the means of lengthening your life through the use of your consciousness, which you can download onto a computer. Just say. So, the way we see ourselves, are we godlike? Do we see ourselves as immortal? Are we being as hubristic as these scientists suggest that we are? Oh, yes, we are. Oh, no, we're not. When I started to work among scientists, I tried to find ways of taking people who were not interested in science, who were scared of science, who were fractal folks, and most of the time it's really difficult because people uh, find themselves alienated by the stuff. But I do have one or two artist friends who said to, to me, yes, we really do need to know about this stuff. It is going to affect us every single day of our lives. And as I said, real generosity towards the future lies in dedicating everything to what happens now. One artist said to me, it's marvelous because I work alone as a writer. It's marvelous that science is collaborative. Scientists work together. And we, in our culture, are very solipsistic, and I happen, I happen to agree. We do live in a solipsistic society in many senses. But that isn't to say that scientists are devoid of ego. My daughter talked about one scientist who's also a science, science explainer. She said, oh, I can't stand that man, Daddy. He thinks evolution's all about him. <laughs> there are many examples of science thinking itself bigger than anything else. Thinking itself, in other words, the pantomime audience, the only skeptic. But that isn't true. Science itself sometimes gets it wrong. For two millennia, people thought that we <laughs> were the center of everything. Oh no, we weren't. We, we aren't. For two millennia, people thought that the, 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 the sun uh, went around the earth. And then it took people like Kepler and Galileo and others to disprove them. By the way, Kepler did not actually say "Epput sin vove." Kepler was uh, Galileo was not uh, tortured. Galileo, as a matter of fact, was asked by the pantomime crowd, the church, what was really going on in terms of the Earth and the Sun, and he said, "The proof that we go around the Sun is the tides." Oh no, it's not. So even science can be extremely arrogant and needs my cat or you, the pantomime audience, to check up on it, to say, oh no, it isn't. When I was about to go to the lab and since then, I've had the privilege of encountering many scientists, many of whom said, oh no, it isn't. I met Dr. Philip Tobias, who said, we grew up on the savannah, oh no, we didn't. We actually grew up in forests. I met um, uh, uh, other scientists who had other ways of disputing uh, what might have gone on in terms of uh, genes, in terms of atoms. There were many uh, people I met in, in terms of, say, quantum mechanics. I had the great joy of meeting Steven Weinberg, who said, you don't think that all the forces are absolutely interrelated? Oh, yes, they are. Rupert Sheldrake came to our lab. 
he gave a talk, people said, oh my God, do you know this guy? I mean, he wrote his bloody book in a bloody ashram. But when he gave his evidence, they didn't say, oh no, it isn't. They said, let's test it, let's see if it's true. And that in the end was what was inspiring for me, having met with Freeman Dyson, who was a wonderful physicist. He too keeps saying, prove it, let's prove it about climate change and so on. But after I had spoken to him, he took down his notebook. He said to me, I'm glad that you're doing this. You're a storyteller and you don't have a theory to protect. And from besides the bust of Einstein, which was near where we were eating, he took down his notebook. And that's one of the reasons why I went to work with scientists. I am inspired by working near genius. I am inspired by seeing what genius is capable of doing. I started by saying real generosity towards the future lies in dedicating everything to what happens now. One of the things that I learned while I was working with these people had to do with the universe as perhaps being a great mind. Oh no, it isn't. Perhaps it is. But the idea of consciousness, the idea that the human mind can go places anew, poets tell us things that perhaps we already know, scientists tell us things that are new. Well, let's see what our consciousness is capable of doing. Guy said to me, I'm fascinated by the science of consciousness and I'm looking forward to entering it in the year 2800. Consciousness according to, I'm nearly finished, I promise, uh, Vladimir Lubokov said, consciousness, the human mind, what makes us human, is being aware of being aware of being aware of being. Now I encountered a physicist who said perhaps there are two kinds of time to denude that idea of its technology. Let's say that he was talking about being and becoming. So while we're being aware of being aware of being aware of being, by encountering genius, people who explain the world in different ways, I think slowly but surely we're becoming aware of becoming aware of becoming aware of what we're capable of becoming.